Welcome back. Today's a fun story. We've got a one and a half million Kickstarter for a game, which is nothing to sneer at, but this is a Kickstarter that isn't even needed to get the game out the door. It's a really interesting situation with Stormgate. And seriously, when you look at the history of the people behind Stormgate, it's not hard to see why, and I've obviously got a horse in this race. StarCraft II is one of my favorite games of all time, and it's exactly the sort of game the Blizzard Entertainment is capable of making but essentially was unable to make because being an RTS, it just wasn't really capable of being that big, you know, billion dollar franchise that essentially everything kind of had to be. This is effectively a successor game by many of the same people with modern tech, many advancements over the last 10 years of game development. It's really damn impressive. So as a StarCraft player, this speaks to me and broadly for the industry, this is what we want to see. People exiting AAA, founding a studio with a clear purpose and actually being able to execute on a game. Also, there's a core stat that will show just how on board my fellow StarCraft players seem to be with this one. And if you want to get exactly what you want, then check out today's sponsor. Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader. All right, CRPGs have been popping off this year and Rogue Trader is just that. It's a part of this awesome wave. It's a full 40k adaptation by Owlcat Games. Now, what is a Rogue Trader, you may ask? essentially think space pirates, but actually a lot more full Warhammer 40k. What that basically means is you have got an Imperium Warrant of Trade, sort of setting up your noble house. Imagine a bit of a privateer's license. So as heir to a powerful dynasty, you shall get your void ship. Its crew, of course, because it's Warhammer, that means thousands of people, and the Cronus Expanse, the sector of space where the game is set. There are Xenos to purge, resources to capture, colonies to establish, and of course, all of those foul spawn of the warp to deal with. You know, cults, demons, all sorts of 40k goodness. And of course, you'll do this along with a host of companions. A rogue psyker, Alderai, Sororitas, uh, Ulfar, the big space wolf who will maul anything uh, close up. Pretty damn cool as a tank. Of course, it's a full CRPG. Your choices will matter a great deal. And Alcat Games have a wealth of experience making CRPGs. It's literally what their studio does. So think choices that matter, fleshed out characters, deep, excellently written dialogue, absolutely full of flavor, bringing the 40k verse to life, and all with a combat system based on what all that you and your companions can bring to the turn-based tactical combat, so you're leveraging your abilities, positioning, cover, and the environment. And you know what? To put it simply, Rock Paper Shotgun said, Rogue Trader is the first Warhammer 40k game I've played that feels genuinely epic. Uh, so yeah, the game is damn big. So check out Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader on Steam today at that link down below. And man, this absolutely incredible year for CRPGs is only continuing. Okay, Stormgate was announced a while back at Gamescom, I believe. More recently then, they've had their Kickstarter. At the same time, they also had a show match at DreamHack which was actually kind of awesome. Now the Kickstarter went up and within 15 minutes, the goal was achieved. Within 24 hours, $1 million in fan funding. And as of the time of this video, they're pretty much in and around one and a half million dollars. And all of this happened before, of course, they're featuring at the Game Awards where we had um, Simu Luger, who was voicing one of the faction leads. And also they uh, basically announced that one of the ex-Blizzard guys is involved in the narrative that they're doing. So maybe it'll feel a little bit like Matsony, which to a lot of people, uh, they like because they like Chris Matson's work. In this case, it's not Chris Matson, it's Mickey Nelson, but he was quite involved in, uh, yeah, a lot of those Blizzard games way back in the day. And the reasons for hype are very simple. This is loads of ex-Blizzard and ex-Command and Conquer devs. I mean, they basically, like, they have the blessing of Mike Morheim. Dreamhaven did uh, help them out a bit, at the very least. There are many reasons, of course, to be excited. Now, one of the interesting things with Kickstarters, though, sometimes those games can fail, right? The money can evaporate. So here's the interesting part of the Kickstarter for Stormgate. Basically, they already have full funding up to release. I mean, you'd sort of hope so. They had a $25 million investment from back in 2022. So what the Kickstarter is essentially offering is the likes of physical collector's edition, you know, beta testing perks, all that kind of thing, and also some stretch goals for new features, a few of which have actually already been hit. Stuff like a new player assist tool, weekly mutators for the PvE mode, and more. And by the way, the PvE mode, that will be interesting to get into. I've spoken to some ex-people from in and around these teams, and the stats around StarCraft II are absolutely fascinating. By its own numbers that it was generating, it was a nice, healthy, safe, profitable game. 
It just wasn't profitable enough for the bigwigs. This is, of course, exactly what you would expect. So essentially, then, the Kickstarter is kind of working as a fan buy-in thing, almost kind of like being able to purchase a Founders Pack, beta access, access, or, you know, included, like, the campaign that would have a, you know, premium component, because the game itself is going to be free-to-play. And they've actually spoken about why they've chosen free-to-play. Basically, for them, it's a multiplayer game, right? It's mostly a multiplayer game, and whether that is doing, like, competitive ladder or playing co-op, they know that having low matchmaking times is is going to be very important to them. So their plan is to basically do free to play. And yes, that does mean it's a live service title. However, they're of course committing to do that in a way that is, you know, not full of bollocks. Overall for a game like this, I think that's basically fair. As an example, they say that whenever StarCraft 2 went free to play, it actually doubled its players. And that can actually be paired in with the success of StarCraft 2's co-op commanders mode, where basically you have all of these like big characters from StarCraft. They all have kind of like different abilities, progression and that sort of thing. And uh, there are the sort of rotating co-op commanders missions that you play, funny enough, in co-op. And this feature was actually the biggest one. It was the main way that people were playing Legacy of the Void. And now, of course, you think about StarCraft 2. What do you think about? You think about 1v1 ladder. No, co-op commanders was getting way more play than that. Now, obviously, 1v1 ladder is the beating heart of StarCraft. Nobody's going to say, you know, no to that. But the option of that sort of more like chilled co-op gameplay mode that was wildly popular with people so for all these reasons you can basically see thinking about what was going on with legacy of the void which was a successful product that many people on this team were involved with and they're essentially evolving that as they move into Stormgate. Now, as a part of that, they're doing this in Unreal Engine, but the bit that kind of matters more, it's not really the engine, it's their own set of, like, tools, the things that they have built within the engine that will allow them to, you know, actually execute the game. One of their headline stats is that they can support 1,000 units on screen. And actually, this matters quite a lot. Even if we're not going to be having 1,000 units in a normal ladder match, well, think about modding. Think about like custom games. One of the great things about Star 2 is the custom maps, right? That people were able to make. And it's not just custom maps, you know, it's full on new game modes, basically stuff like the StarCraft editor is like, that's basically where League of Legends and like Dota come from. That's all from Warcraft 3's uh, map editor, right? So I remember, I oh man, I cannot remember the exact name of the game, but it was one of my favorite custom games. And you would have just big squads of like hundreds of Marines it was crazy, and the StarCraft II engine just couldn't handle it. So it's really nice then that they're actually able to do that sort of thing because the amount of creativity that could be unleashed by their custom maps, I mean, that could be really something special. This could essentially act as, once again, a sort of platform for ongoing game development, and on that, they have some very interesting plans. Now, the fighting games community also is interesting here. One of the things that's been massive in the FGC is the implementation of rollback technology, and this essentially exists to eliminate the risk of lag from gameplay despite there being high latency between players. There's many cases of essentially fan-ran campaigns and even fan-made mods to get rollback into these games to basically protect the competitive integrity of the experience. Now, any StarCraft II player, of course, will know that StarCraft II did not support LAN. It was only playable on BNet. And you would have in actual official Blizzard tournaments connection issues that just wouldn't happen if it was in a LAN like you would have gotten StarCraft I. And sometimes this could just totally scuff a game. It would need to be replayed. And especially for the competitors, like imagine if you were actually doing quite well, you know? You were kind of dominating your opponent, but there you go. Match is broken, gonna have to do a redo. That's going to be a crazy mental position for you to be in. So this is really good for the competitive integrity that yes, Stormgate just has rollback, which is so sick to have in an RTS. Now, thankfully with all of this, Frost Giant are being, for my view anyway, very cautious, very open, and very realistic about the game. So basically they're calling their launch kind of year zero, right? The early access year, where they'll essentially just be working out like, how will this game be received? Uh, you know, they'll be rolling out campaign content and that kind of thing. This is very wise for them to do. And of course, it also means that they can start to monetize the game earlier on. And this is a situation where I do think that that is a perfectly reasonable thing, given that this is a very for, really, this is a for the fans, by the fans sort of game. Just give people the opportunity to support be honest about like what the deal actually is and that's totally cool 
uh, as far as I'm concerned. Especially because the more that they feel safe to just hone and iterate and craft that game, that is exactly what we need. We don't want a situation where they basically have to launch into a full launch, fully monetized, way too early, to the point where it actually damages the project's chance of success. So I think that's very wise. Actually, one of the major things they're going to have next year, I believe, is the unveiling of their third faction, because right now it's basically just the humans and the demons, but they do have another faction in the works. And obviously for a game like this, early access, betas, all of that is so damn important. I'm actually very happy to say I'm in the current closed beta. I wasn't able to play it because basically my PC is currently scuffed. I'm limited to this machine. And of course, this logo means most your Steam library won't work. One of the awesome things that's happened though, and this is right after they did their server slam event, is they announced that they're actually just going to leave the servers up over like through Christmas. So I am thrilled to say I will be able to play plenty of Stormgate over the break. There really was a sense of almost hopelessness whenever we basically found out that StarCraft II wouldn't be getting more support. And you see, there was glimmers of hope before that, because they started doing some cosmetic uh, DLC, like, purchases. And honestly, they did look pretty cool. I bought a bunch of them because I really love StarCraft, and I, I found value in that, I suppose. And it was also a game that I wanted to support, and it helped that some of that stuff went to support the esports funds as well. So I did that. There was Nova Ops, which was a mission pack, which maybe made us think, oh, we could get more mission packs. And then... <laughs> The whole thing's dead, right? And what we essentially have is the team that was responsible for StarCraft and for Heroes of the Storm internally in Blizzard, they were a team one, basically just gone, dissolved. Which in a way does mean if Blizzard is to do this sort of thing again, if they are going to re-enter the RTS space, in many ways, they will need to rebuild from scratch. And it's one of the really sad things because of course, Blizzard Entertainment were really a real-time strategy studio. That's the crazy thing. They just had so much success with some other games that RTSs just bled away into the background. And I suppose as we actually think about the RTS genre more broadly, I actually get more happy about the way that they're doing this and the amount of openness that they're showing. I mean, in all of their communications, they have been very community oriented. They have so many StarCraft II pros. I believe either like consulting and gameplay stuff or at the very least like doing show matches like the one that I recently watched that was uh, going on at DreamHack. But one of the problems we've had with RTS is actually this year is, I mean, a lot of games that have not had ideal releases. So we got Company of Heroes, that had a very troubled launch, even though for, you know, for my view, it was doing some exciting things with campaign, but no, between bugs and other issues, definitely it struggled. We've got Warhammer at Realms of Ruin, which does seem to be a peak frontier developments game where it looks great. It's got some great features, some great technical stuff, but it just doesn't have the content and it feels like a minimum viable product. Of course, if you've played a lot of the games from Frontier, like at times Elite Dangerous, like say uh, the Jurassic World uh, Evolution, uh, I think one and two, uh, those have had those problems as well. So this came out, I think, where a lot of people wanted Dawn of War, but for the Warhammer Fantasy, in this case, the Age of Sigmar setting. In ways, you've got that, but not fully. Obviously, Total War Pharaoh, which we've talked about to death. Then we've got Star Trek Infinite, which is basically Star Trek Stellaris, that is inspired by the Star Trek Stellaris mod. And that also had a really, really troubled launch where I think a lot of people just kind of said, yeah, while the mod may have problems inherent to it being a mod, just play the mod. Thankfully, Last Train Home, uh, sort of a different kind of game, but that's got a really good support. And also Shadow Gambit, the cursed crew from Studio uh, Minimi, I believe they're called. By the way, you will have heard us talk about how that studio shut down. I actually just got an email just before this from somebody who said that actually a lot of those devs have actually found jobs locally because of another studio. So there is actually a bit of good news there. Essentially then, a lot of the problems that the likes of Star Trek Infinite, Pharaoh, Realms of Rune, Company of Heroes 3, a lot of the problems they've had I do not think are going to be as present in Stormgate because of the way they are developing this game. They've got a pretty robust testing schedule going for next year. And then there is just, as I look at the gameplay, I just go to uh, Loco for, uh, for, for my StarCraft content. It was really neat to see, this is just from his YouTube analytics, that yeah, Stormgate is actually doing really well, kind of clobbering some of that StarCraft content. And in a way that is normal, right? Because hey, it's the big new thing. But you see, if you're a YouTuber and you're moving like, out of format 
Like if I did a Final Fantasy video on my Warcraft channel, or I even did say a Warcraft 3 video on my Warcraft channel, or maybe even a Warcraft 4 video on my World of Warcraft channel, if Warcraft 4 was to exist, you would sometimes struggle to get the audience over there because it's a different thing from what they're looking for. So that, his inbuilt StarCraft audience, has essentially one-to-one -one just immediately went over and accepted Stormgate as the natural continuation of StarCraft. I think that is an absolutely major thing that does show that community buy-in, of course, as does the Kickstarter. And as for watching the game itself, um, there are many ways in which you can clearly see that it's beta, right, between what the Observer interface looks like and a few issues like that. But I've got to say, from, you know, what just looks like the sort of, um, performance kind of just that blizzard quality responsiveness i suppose it does seem that they have got that looking at the new units actually a lot of them are really cool they've got a really neat mechanic with trees actually where units who are too big cannot move through certain areas of tree and that means that it's only really your smaller units who can use those so that actually does a lot in the like early to mid game I think in terms of like, you know, your angles of attack, that sort of thing. Later on, and actually I don't think they've implemented tier three units yet, but later on with some of your bigger units, they can actually be used to clear out those tree lines. And there's other examples as well. Uh, they have uh, creep camps, which you would say is a bit of an inspiration from MOBAs, but that would be forgetting that creep camps in an RTS, that's a thing from Warcraft 3, right? So we've got creep camps here. Now, I think about some of the skirmishing that would go on in a StarCraft match, and adding creep camps on top of that actually does, like that adds another dimension to map control, just in addition to say the sensor towers that you'd be getting in, in Star 2. So to me, that's also really quite interesting. There's just lots of little things that I saw, lots of little touches throughout the gameplay that to me were just like, oh, that's kind of, that's massaging my RTS gamer brain. And one of the other things is, this is Mana playing against TLO. Obviously, if you're watching StarCraft around the period I was, you'll know these names. Seeing like the way that they are controlling units, the way that they are microing units, it feels, it looks like StarCraft, I suppose. It looks like it's got that nice, precise micromanagement gameplay. Like in addition to everything else here, you can see, you know, capturing a vision camp, which is one example here. You can basically see the camp is like listed as a vision camp. I think it just has like a placeholder mob on it that does a bunch of damage. But yeah, there's camps to clear. Um, there's like a siege camp that ends up being really cool whenever the siege camp is got. It basically spawns this like siege sort of catapult thingy unit. And what's cool about this, right? It launches that ball of energy, but immediately it tells you like exactly its radius. So it's quite, it, like it's done quite well around counterplay. I, I think there are some issues around readability, which is one of the harder things to solve in a real-time strategy game, especially as you are able to up your visual fidelity. A great example there is Warcraft 3 versus Warcraft 3 Reforged, where I think Reforged is so much less readable because of the higher detailed models um, and the sort of slightly deviating from the original sort of art style thing that was going on in that game. But anyway, whenever I, as a StarCraft player, look at this, I'm basically seeing exactly what I would want and I cannot wait to actually get in and play. And what this kind of means for like us, the, the sort of StarCraft community, I, I don't know what it's been like for you guys, but for us, it was sort of like our game was put in life support. There wasn't really another thing like it out there. And it really did feel like, cool, well, you know, we'll keep Legacy of the Void alive. We'll show up and watch the, you know, watch the matches, support the teams and the pros, but there is nothing new coming from Blizzard. And now there's something new. There is a successor and it looks like a true successor that is also smart enough to know how it can realistically be developed in the modern market. Of course, with how they are putting quite a large focus on having that uh, multiplayer mode where you essentially have hero characters, meaning it's basically like a co-op Warcraft 3 kind of situation. And again, looks really fun. So essentially, this is one of those very rare good timeline moments from everything that I can tell. And yes, there still could be problems, absolutely. But so often in the industry, we see something get corrupted, get worse, get full of bad stuff, and the community feels like they're consistently at odds with the developer and the publisher. This seems like one of those goddamn rare instances where a startup is able to just go make a high-budget game, hyper-target, tar like exactly 
the, the sort of, you know, the sort of game, the sort of community, and just succeed. This is just peak. The developers want more StarCraft. The fans want more StarCraft. Blizzard ain't gonna do it, so goddamn it, we're gonna do it together. And that just, uh, I don't know, that just actually makes me have a little bit of hope for the future that things like this can happen. I will be playing in the beta. Obviously, I am biased about this, but I think, uh, as an example, I'm also a big fan of the Total War franchise. You know, the, the Total War equivalent of this is like getting a Rome 3 or a Medieval 3. That's the equivalent here. So maybe that kind of helps you understand. Or, you know, imagine if they make a new Dead Space game, but in the same vein as the Dead Space remake, and they actually give you the good timeline version of that franchise that's unpolluted and uncorrupted. That is essentially what it kind of feels like to me and it just feels damn good so that's the situation definitely you know i, I want to shout these guys out get get them some support because i think uh, honestly i think their heart's in the right place um and i think they're quite genuinely doing this out of a very real passion for what is in my opinion one of uh, really one of the greatest games ever made certainly one of the, if not the greatest, real-time strategy games ever made. Just makes me happy. That's it for today's video. Thank you for watching, of course. Check out today's sponsor. There's actually some shared DNA between all of these games, considering, you know, Warhammer uh, and StarCraft and a lot of the inspirations going on there. And then, of course, can then carry through, like, into Stormgate and everything. Uh, I don't know. I just think it's kind of, uh, it's kind of neat that these things lined up. Anyway, so you can check out, of course, Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader, who have sponsored today's video. Uh, with that said... That's it for me. Have a brilliant day. I'll see you next time.